get the PowerPoint pulled up here for you in a minute. And I think this is a little bit too loud. So let me pull this down. Good morning. good morning. It's certainly good to see everyone here. Uh, it is certainly different to be here. It kind of uh, feels funny being in the church building again, but it's a great day, and uh, I'm thankful for you all being in attendance. Um, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Ezra chapter, uh, Ezra chapter 5. We're going to be looking at several passages in, ex, uh, in Esther, uh, excuse me, Ezra this morning and other passages too. Uh, but I want us to think about... Uh, being a bouncing back strong. If anybody here has ever had any experience with, uh, with working out as far as your muscles are concerned or physical exercise, you're probably familiar with uh, uh, having to go through a little bit of adversity. Because when you do it and your body's not used to it, the morning, next morning when you wake up, you're going to probably be a little bit sore. Uh, if you've been working your arms out and you're not, uh, your muscles are not used to it, you might have difficulty lifting your, your arms all the way up because your body is just not used to it. Now as you progress and do it more and more, your body gets more used to it and the pain goes away. And you can drink protein shakes and things like that to help replenish the muscles and that will help in going a long way. But, uh, uh, but it, it, your body is just not used to it so it's going to be difficult. And as I think about that, and I think about bouncing back, uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, comes to my mind. It says, Let steadfastness have its full effect, so that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, I think that's an important thing, an important phrase found in those verses. Let steadfastness have its full effect. Do your best to let steadfastness and, and, and to let patience uh, be a driving motivator to progress, if indeed we trust in the wisdom of God, is what James is getting at when he, uh, w as, uh, as we continue to read. Let steadfastness have its full effect, uh, because wisdom of God is going to help us do that. And we have all had to push through a little bit of adversity here lately. Over the last few months, we've all had to alter our lifestyles. We have all had to do things just a little bit differently. But now we begin to look into the future. Now we begin to look forward and get, back, get things back to normal. And I think this morning is a great day for us to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think a great lesson, or a great, uh, a thing, a great a passage of Scripture to help us learn that lesson is looking at the book of Ezra and some of the things that are involved there. If you've been in the Bible class on Sunday morning before we dismissed uh, our regular assembly, we were studying the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And what I want us to do is just kind of refresh our memories about some of the things that we talked about, but also learn some things, some new things, that kind of help us understand this idea of bouncing back strong. Because that's exactly what Israel had to do when they came back from Babylonian captivity. And so as we begin, we look at the restoration project's progression uh, because things seem to be going very well as they come back. You look at chapter 1, and Cyrus has allowed the people of Israel to pick everything up and come back home if they want to. You go to chapter 2 and verse 70. It says, Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns and all the rest of Israel in their towns. And so you've got the priests and the Levites probably living in the city of Jerusalem itself, everybody else occupying the city surrounding Jerusalem. Them being able to come back has got to be a great day for them. But you go to chapter 3 and you begin reading, and it says, When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatil, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the, God of, uh, to the, uh, of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So not only do they get to come home, 
Now they've got to build an altar. Now they're getting to restore the worship service to where it needs to be according to the law of Moses. But you move on to verse 8 and you find there's even more progression that's happening. Now in the second year, after they're coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel the son of Shelatiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. So not only have they come home and settled in their towns, not only have they rebuilt the altar and reestablished the worship service, now they're starting construction on the house of God, on the temple. They've built the foundations, or they've began to build those foundations. Things seem to be going very well. Finally, things are looking up. After 70 years of captivity, things are going Israel's way. But it doesn't take long for opposition to occur. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? Things seem to be going so well in our lives, and then all of a sudden, bam, we're hit with something that we have to stand up to, some kind of opposition. Uh, many of you know that a couple of months ago I went to Joplin, Missouri to, uh, to preach at a church there. The preacher uh, that was there for nine, nine and a half years, he was telling me on the phone one day about when he started. He started there and everybody was excited about him uh, be, uh, beginning his, his ministry there. He was excited about beginning his ministry there. They had all of these plans about future growth, spiritual growth, numerical growth. Everyone was excited about the plan that was set in order by the elders. And they were ready to go, ready to get started. Then, the big tornado that hit Joplin several years ago happened. The entire city was leveled. The church building was damaged. And he told me on the phone, Sarah actually just told me the other day that the, the anniversary for that tornado was just a couple of days ago. But he told me on the phone that we never recovered. Nine years went by and things were never the same as far as enthusiasm goes as it was when he first began. Sometimes we get into opposition when things seem to be going so well. Just the other day, I heard JT talking about the youth program and how excited all the kids were about having class. He actually told me that there was a couple of the friends of our kids that wanted to come back to church more often. And then all of a sudden, we're hit with the coronavirus. We can't move forward. We can't even assemble. Things seem to be going so well with the youth program, and then all of a sudden, we're hit with opposition. Israel understands kind of what we're going through, maybe I should say that we understand kind of in a way what Israel had to go through with things going so well, and then bam, hit with opposition. And so what about this opposition? What do we find? The opposition, it's going to occur uh, rather quickly, we might say, but go back to chapter 3. And look at verse 3. We read verses 1 and 2. They've come back, they've, they've rebuilt the altar, and it says, they set the altar in its place. For fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Burnt offerings morning and evening. They're, offer, they're, they're building this altar because there's fear on the people of the lands. Well, what the, where's this fear coming from? Well, apparently there's some adversaries that don't like them building an altar. If we read uh, the book of Jeremiah, verse uh, chapter 41 or so, we read about an altar that was established after captivity. And so what may have occurred is that Israel comes back, they find this altar that's been there, and they just tear it down and build their own altar. They don't want to worship on an old altar. But when we read in Exodus chapter 20, we read that there's laws concerning the altar. You can't just build an altar however you want to. Uh, God had laws concerning how an altar was built. And maybe this altar is built, that it's not according to spec, we might say. And so they're not going to build this altar. It's old, it's not according to spec. So they tear it down and they build their own. I think we can understand opposition coming upon Israel for tearing down this old altar. But we move on to chapter 4. And we'll read some more things about these adversaries. Now, can you turn this down a little bit? This is blowing me away. It's very loud. 
Sorry, but I couldn't take it anymore. Chapter 4, begin reading in verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, as we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers... Houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Why don't they allow these people to help them? They worship the exact same God. Uh, things can get done faster. We already know that they fear these people anyway, and so this is a good way to, to, to push aside that fear and for them to build a relationship with one another. So why do they, do they oppose them? Well, we learn a little bit more about these people, and when we learn a little bit more about these people, it's going to help us understand why they react the way that they do. Because it says, yes, they worship the same God, but ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings 17 is going to help us understand more about these people that have been exiled to Samaria by this king, by the Assyrian kings, not necessarily Esarhaddon in 2 Kings 17, but kings of, uh, of Assyria, several of them, it was, a, it was a common thing for them to do to exile a people to other nations, and Samaria was one of those places. Begin reading with me in verse 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. The king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there, and let him go and dwell there, and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. So why are they worshiping the one true God? It's because the people that were exiled there, Samaritans and people from other nations as well, not just Samaritans, but people from other nations have been exiled to this land and all of a sudden they start worshiping any God and whoever God they want to and God says, you know what? I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to let you occupy the land that I gave my fathers and just worship whatever God you want to. So he brings lions upon this, these people and judges these people for their sin and their idolatry. And the people say, well, you know, we got to get... Uh, uh, we got to get some people in here that know what's going on, that know how to worship according to the God of this land. And that's why they're worshiping the one true God. But it doesn't end there. As we continue reading, we learn something else. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrines of the places that the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities in which they lived. We could, we could continue on, but the point is made clear. Yeah, they're worshiping the God of Israel, but that's not the only God that they're worshiping. What's going to happen if Israel says, yeah, come on, you guys can help us build this, uh, build this altar or build this temple. We can get it done quicker. We'd love for you to do that. How long is it going to take for them to engage in polytheism? Not very long. So, I think when it comes to opposition with Israel, we might can see it in two forms. First of all, we might see it in the uh, Babylonian and Assyrian captivities initially, but that's all Israel's fault. They are the ones that fell into idolatry. 
They are the ones that uh, perverted justice. They are the ones that didn't take care of the widows and the orphans. There are more things that we could talk about, but those are the big three that Jeremiah and Isaiah talk about are the reasons that they went into captivity to begin with. But also, that was their fault, but also the opposition brought on them when they came back from the land of, uh, when they came back from, uh, from Babylonian captivity. They received opposition in trying to build everything back and reestablished uh, uh, things back to the way that God wanted them to be. But it doesn't stop there. Even further in history, we read, we read where the opposition continues to occur. We'll come back to verses 4 and 5 here in just a minute. But look at verses 6 and following. In the reign of Ahasuerus, that's otherwise known King Xerxes I. This is the king that's under consideration in the book of Esther. King Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Ezra has jumped forward 50 years to King Ahasuerus. From Cyrus the, uh, the Great all the way up to King Ahasuerus is about 50 years, the beginning of King Ahasuerus' reign, about 50 years. So he's jumped way forward to describe further opposition that's going on even further into the, uh, Israel's history. We move to verse 7 and we find that in the days of Artaxerxes, this happened as we continue reading. Ezra's jumped forward another 22 years and so Ezra jumps forward around 70, 72 years to describe this opposition didn't stop just in the days of Cyrus. It continues to go on for 70-something years. Artaxerxes is the king that Nehemiah is cupbearer to this king. He may be the king under consideration uh, uh, with uh, Micah's prophesying years too, uh, possibly, just as a side note. But 70 years into the future, Israel is still dealing with this opposition. And so how do, are people going to respond to this blowback or to this, uh, to, to this refusal to, to, help the, to have these people help them rebuild the altar? We come back to verses 4 and 5. We come back and we find this, the effect on the refusal, verses 4 and 5. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah, and made them afraid to build. This word that's translated discouraged literally means to drop the hands or to weaken the hands. You ever been doing something that was hard and difficult and you got frustrated and you just dropped the wrench or you dropped whatever it was, said, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore, and you got frustrated, you got discouraged? That's exactly what happened to Israel. Just a few months ago, I was uh, trying to take the lawnmower blades off of my lawnmower to sharpen them. And if you've ever tried to do that, it can be kind of difficult because that grass gets caked up under there and it serves as kind of a, a super glue, if you will, holding the nuts there and you can't even hardly get them off. I was, tr I was tugging and I was pulling. I had a hammer. I was beating on that wrench and nothing was budging. I threw that hammer down. I threw that wrench down. I said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. About 10 minutes later, I went back to it. But that's exactly what happened to Israel. Only, we'll talk about how long it took for Israel to get back to work here in just a second. But it doesn't stop there. They discouraged them, but how did they discourage them? They bribed counselors, probably some Jewish, uh, or excuse me, some uh, Persian authority figures of some kind. They bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. But how long did this happen? All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and more specifically, the second year of the reign of Darius. Chapter 4 and verse 24. The work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped. And it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. How long is this? About 15 or 16 years. The people of Israel said, we can't do it. We can't build the house of God anymore. There's too much opposition. There's too much blowback. We can't do this. And so Israel's got a problem. There's not a doubt in my mind that they want to get back to work. They want to build the house of the Lord. They want to do everything right. But the opposition is there. And it's frustrated their purpose. And they've stopped work. So who's going to be there? 
to push them forward, to help them bounce back even stronger than they did before. Enter the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. I just want to talk about one of them this morning. I want to talk about Haggai. If you want to distinguish these two prophets, they're prophesying at the exact same time to the exact same people. Zechariah's focus is spiritual. Haggai's focus is physical. Zechariah is full of a lot of apocalyptic language. His focus is completely on the messianic reign of Jesus Christ. That's what his focus is on. But Haggai has a focus on the physical implications of Israel's restoration and its outlook to the reign of the Messiah. And so we come to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and this is what it says. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. I think I need to switch slides. Now let's turn over to Haggai chapter 1. With, uh, with what we just read in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 of Ezra, keep that in mind, because it basically says the same thing as we begin reading the book of Haggai in chapter 1. Verse 1, I'll give you a couple of minutes to find there, a couple of or more seconds to find that. Haggai is not a book we go to very often. But it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Why were the people saying that? They were expecting for everything to be perfect before they started building the house of God. They said to themselves, well, apparently it's not time for us to rebuild the house of the Lord. Because if it, if it was time to rebuild the house of the Lord, then God wouldn't allow these people to oppress us and push us the other way. Apparently, it's just simply not time. Do you ever know someone that does things like that? When I get my life in order, when everything is perfect, then I'll obey the gospel. I like to drink a little bit. When I get tired of drinking and I decide to put down the bottle completely and never drink again, then I'll obey the gospel. You know, I, I work at a place where it's kind of difficult for me to, to do what the Bible says. There's a lot of people there that, uh, uh, that just don't live the, 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 the moral life that they should live. And it's going to be hard for me to do what's right around those people. Whenever I retire, then I'll obey the gospel. I've heard things like that a lot of times from people. Waiting for things in their lives to be perfect before they do what God wants them to do. And that's exactly what Israel did here. But God said, it's, it's not your decision to decide when things are right and when things are not. It's mine. And we see that as we continue to look forward because we learned some lessons here in the book of Haggai. We haven't done a whole lot of application up until this point in this lesson, a lot of historical uh, look at, the, at, at what Scripture says, but let's note some things that we can learn from all of this. The first thing that we learn is that opposition is never an acceptable motive to complacency. That's what Israel was doing, but look at how, resp uh, uh, look at how God responds. The word of the Lord, begin reading in verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord, the host, the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. 
Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house? Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. God never told Israel to stop working. Israel stopped working. Cyrus never told Israel to stop working. It was, it was a decision that they had made on their own because of the opposition. They'd done all of this work on their own houses. They'd done all of this work growing as many crops as they could possibly find, thinking, yeah, we're going to have some left over, enough to last through the winter. And they were actually running out of crops. Why? Because God said, since you're starting to work on your own things and not on what I want you to, then I'm going to show you who's boss. Opposition is never an acceptable motive for complacency. We also learn here that order and movement might take a little bit of time. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 1, you've got to kind of read into the text, uh, not necessarily read into the text, but you've got to look a little bit further into it to kind of get this. But in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, that's when the Lord, word of the Lord came to Haggai to say, get up, rebuild things. We'll go over to chapter 1 and verse 15. Chapter 14 says how they got up and they began to work. But on 15, uh, in verse 15, it tells us when this happened. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius. 23 days after Haggai initially told them to get to work is when they actually did go ahead and get to work. It takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of preparation. It's not something you just wake up the next morning and just go do. Kind of a little bit of application for our purpose. Uh, I'm surprised at how many people are here this morning, to be honest with you. I, I didn't expect it to be this many people, but still not everybody. And you can't expect everybody to be here on the very first Sunday that we come back and decide to have worship service together. It's going to take a little bit of time. But just because everybody is not here doesn't mean we're going to wait till everybody is ready, then we'll come back to church. We can't do things that way. And Israel couldn't do things that way either when it came to rebuilding the house of the Lord. It came on God's time, not on their time. What would happen if we decided, to, you know, we're just going to wait till everybody is ready? No telling when we would come back to services. We can't withhold the people that want to because of the people that don't want to. Israel couldn't do, could, uh, couldn't do the exact same thing for the right reasons or for the, the reasons that are given here in Scripture, according to God. And so it's going to take a little bit of time. But here's the third thing that I want to leave you with. God takes strength to a whole new level. And we get this when we look over at chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And this is where I get the strong idea. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. I think we understand very well why God wanted Zerubbabel to be strong. Because he's the governor. He's one of the authority figures that's going to be pushing these people forward. I think we can understand why he wants Joshua to be strong because he's the spiritual leader of the people and being high priest. But those are not the only people that needed to be strong. Everyone needed to be strong because they were working forward to the purpose that God set out from the very, very beginning for Israel, even when they came out of the land of Egypt. There's one more thing I want us to look at, and then we will close. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I think this is a great theme verse for our situation and for Israel's situation that we have been looking at this morning too. Romans chapter 8, these verses are, are, are very well known uh, to us, and I think they fit well. Beginning in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What Paul basically said is this. He said, what then shall we say to these things? What he's been talking about up until this point is salvation always comes according to God's will. That's the point that he's been making. And so since all things, since salvation comes to the people that accept Jesus as their Savior and obey Him, since God's will always comes to those who want salvation, we have nothing to worry about. Because he's always going to be our, on our side fighting for those exact same things that he was fighting for when he sent Jesus to die on the cross in the first place. Israel has the exact same application. They let the opposition get them down. They dropped their hands and said, we can't do this. But through Haggai, God said, yes, you can. Because it's my will. Just like it was back when you left Egypt. It's still my will now. And there's something greater to look forward to in the future with the reign of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. How do you think Israel felt when they came back from Jerusalem, or came back to Jerusalem for the first time? In captivity for 70 years. Then they come back home and they see everything in ruins. We get a glimpse of it at the uh, latter verses uh, of chapter 3 how they, some of them are crying out and, and they're, they're proud of what they've done. They're proud to be worshiping God in Jerusalem. Some of them are crying because they remember how things used to be and maybe it's never going to be the same ever again in their minds. It was a difficult thing for them to swallow. I don't know if I've ever felt more different being inside of a church building than I do right now. I didn't live my life faithful for a long time and it felt weird going to church knowing that I was living in sin but I don't think it felt more weird than it does now it's different but I can also stand up here with a smile on my face knowing that the end is near we can bounce back strong just like Israel bounced back strong even more faithful than we were before yeah it might take a little bit it might take a few weeks for everyone to decide, I'm going to get back to church and live my life normally again in a spiritual sense. It might take a few weeks for that to happen. I know a friend of mine in Georgia that they went back to church a couple of weeks ago. They had 10 people there. The very next Sunday, they had 11 people there. That's a small progression, but it's more than it was the week before. It's something that we have to look forward to something we have to pray about. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad to be here myself. There may be someone here this morning that, yeah, you're here, but maybe you're not here spiritually. Maybe you've let things of the past kind of kind of grab your spiritual focus and take it away. Uh, maybe you need to ask for prayers of the congregation. We want to help anyone here that needs prayers. Maybe there's someone here that wants to know more about what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to accept Jesus as my Savior? What, it, what does it mean to obey Him? What does the Bible say? Ask those questions this morning and you will find the answer. If you're here this morning and you need us for any reason, please respond to the invitation as we stand and sing.